effects. I want to explain the actual cosmic rays, the physics behind the cosmic rays that I'm detecting, because they are at the heart of the project. So, uh, let's get started. Um, most of what I'm detecting comes from the sun. So, solar storms, um, solar wind, and rarely you can get stuff from supernova. Um, and so that's what the data, the actual data that I'm trying to collect is those cosmic rays. So they can come, they can come really from anywhere, but most of the time they come from the sun. So most of what it is, is high energy protons impacting the upper atmosphere. Um, and when they hit the upper atmosphere, they actually decay to positive and, um, negative pions, which are a type of meson. Um, those pions then decay into muons, and a muon is sort of like a heavy electron. Um, it has a charge of minus one, but it's, it's much more massive, um, and it has a mean lifetime of about 2.2 microseconds. Now, it actually takes the muon uh, longer than that to get down to my detector. However, due to relativistic effects, it can still actually make it, and in fact, most of them probably go through the Earth, or most of the way, at least. Um, because muons have a very low cross-section, uh, which means that they rarely, rarely interact with matter itself. So um, this leads to some very nice things, is that one, my detector not only is sensitive to cosmic rays, it's sensitive to electric fields, light, um, and also any other radiation. So I have to limit that. Now the nice thing about muons having a really low cross-section is that I can actually put this thing in my basement um, and have the whole house actually shield it from radiation in the ground uh, and in the air. And the muons will happily pass right through my house and hit the scintillator plastic because uh, they have such a low cross-section. Obviously, rarely a few muons will interact with my house and I won't measure them. However, you know, this is so rare that it's not, um, it's not a problem. So uh, most of the muons will pass right through my house, they'll pass right through the air, they'll pass right through airplanes, uh, whatever you whatever's in their way, basically, they'll just go right through it. Uh, and that includes my scintillator as well, is that um, while it's probably fairly efficient uh, at catching the muons, there's definitely going to be, you know, some that slip through. My guess is probably about 75% of the muons will slip through, um, because if they don't interact with my house, um, they, they wouldn't interact so much with the plastic either. However, it's like the neutrinos at Fermilab. Uh, muons, muons have a um, much higher cross-section than neutrinos, uh, however, it's still fairly low. Uh, but with the neutrinos, they can correlate, you know, four or five events per month, whereas I'm getting hundreds of events per minute. So I don't really see the, that that's not a really a problem for me, and it's, it hasn't been a problem for anybody else either. So um, that's, that's it, really. Uh, High-energy protons impact the upper atmosphere, decay into positive and negative pions, which decay into muons, which relativistically uh, can make it through the atmosphere, even though their lifetime is only 2.2 microseconds. And then since they have such a, um, a low cross-section, they can actually make it through my house before they get down to the detector, where the muons actually interact with scintillator plastic. Okay, so uh, that's the detail on these cosmic rays. And like I said, th these protons can really come from almost anywhere, um, and keep in mind that this scintillator is sensitive to lots of, lots of different particles. So wh what is the scintillator actually? Well, the scintillator, a scintillator is defined as something that lights up when uh, something not, not visible, well, when not light hits it. So my scintillator can, um, will light up when almost anything hits it. So uh, if UV light hits it, it'll, it outputs about a blue light. So I don't quite remember what the uh, wavelength of blue light is, but it outputs a blue light. So if you bombard it with UV, it'll light up blue. Uh, if you were to put uranium next to it, it will actually light up blue. Um, and it'll do that with cosmic rays as well. So uh, what happens is that the muons will actually uh, make the electrons in the scintillator um, jump up an energy level, and then when they go down, they will actually, so the muons will um, cause the electrons to jump up an energy level because the muons' energy will be added to the electron, and then when the electron jumps down, it'll emit that light. And the reason that it's the same frequency light every time is because the electrons can only jump up to specific levels in the, in the atoms, so that's, that's, you can look at the spectroscopy video I had a while ago, uh, but uh, in the scintillator plastic, the electrons can only jump up to a specific en energy level. So um, that's and so when they fall back down, they're always falling back down a specific 
uh, from a specific energy level to a different one. So they always emit the same wavelength of light, which in this case is blue. Um, it's not really important, but you, you usually generally want to match up your scintillator efficiency to your photomultiplier efficiency. So your photomultiplier will have more efficiency at this wavelength than this wavelength. And so if you have a, a scintillator that doesn't match up uh, to the photomultiplier, you're going to um, be losing a lot of information. So, um, like I said, my scintillator is sensitive to lots of stuff. So I do my best to shield it from uh, radiation um, so if you were to just drive by my house with uranium and I was running this detector, I, I would actually probably notice because um, that the gamma rays would probably make it through my house into my basement and they would interact with the scintillator. Um, so the scintillator not only is sensitive to cosmic rays, it's sensitive to other electromagnetic radiation. It's sensitive to almost any type of radiation, uh, especially beta radiation, which is what I'm detecting in muons. So um, that's the scintillator plastic and that's sort of how it works. So uh, in the scintillator plastic, I have it, uh, like I said, sealed up in a cardboard box. Um, and in one, in one end, so the, my scintillator is a square. Uh, it's actually a rectangular prism. And both the square ends of the rectangular prism are, are polished very cleanly. And the actual edges are roughed up. So um, at one of the end that's polished very cleanly, I have a taped on aluminum foil uh, like a mirror. So this way, um, hopefully, some of the photons that will actually come out of the scintillator that are going the wrong way will actually bounce back and head over to the photomultiplier tube. Um, that's just try to try to uh, make my efficiency go up a little bit. Um, and I just sort of stuck the photomultiplier tube to the scintillator and glued them both down and... Um, they are staying solidly in place and I'm seeing no problems uh, so far. Uh, so that's pretty exciting. Um, so this photomultiplier tube, how does it work? Well, you actually, the interesting thing with these experiments is you actually don't need a photomultiplier tube. If you look at the gold foil experiment that uh, Rutherford did, he actually had a similar, well not, not really a similar setup. He was using scintillator plastic and with his scintillator plastic, as well as with mine and all other scintillator plastics, um, if one muon was to strike it, it would produce one photon, okay? And the interesting thing is that your eyes are actually sensitive to singular photons. 